Okay, let's get into it. Let's talk about the most common discrete probability distribution function, the binomial experiment. Now this is by no means the only discrete um, probability distribution function that's common, but it is the most common. Um, your book goes over geometric distributions and Poisson's, and your calculator actually has both of those functions embedded into it. If you want to read more, great. We're just not going to cover it in this class, but they're fun. I, I mean, I think the binomials are fun. I think the geometrics and the Poisson's are fun too. But here's what it takes to be in a binomial experiment. And there's four properties. You have to be able to check through each of them and say, yes, all four of these properties have been met. And then when you realize you are dealing with a binomial distribution, what happens is you get these kind of nice shortcutty formulas. All right, so when we get into this special case of, yes, I'm in a binomial distribution, I don't have to make my own table anymore. So instead of making a table, you just write this symbol. It's so much nicer. All right, and instead of doing one bar stats L1, L2, you have quicker formulas for it. You don't have to make vens and trees. You just get these calculator functions. It's awesome. But the, the toughest part is recognizing you're in a binomial distribution, all right? So that, that's always the, 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 the catch. Do you recognize that you, you're in this column and that you get to use these shortcuts? And a way to think about it is if, if you don't recognize you're in this column and you start thinking, oh my gosh, I gotta make a chart or a table with 26 columns in it, why is she asking me to do this? I'm, I'm not. It means it was probably a binomial distribution and there's some shortcuts. All right, so let's, let's take a look, okay? So the binomial experiment, here are your four properties. The ex experiment has to consist of a fixed number of observations called trials, and that's a special number that we'll use, so we give it the letter N. All right, so there has to be a fixed number of trials, fixed number of observations in our experiment. We're gonna run this experiment seven times, eight times, 25 times. Whatever it is, it's fixed. Each trial can result in only one or one of only two mutually exclusive outcomes labeled success or failure. All right, so if I can categorize my outcomes into success or failure, and I always put success in quotes because sometimes what we're counting really isn't that successful in, the, in terms of like the real world and life but it's whatever we're counting. We're gonna deem that as a success and then its complement will be the failure. And they're mutually exclusive. Here's a big one that we always have to be on the lookout for. So outcomes of different trials are independent. We picked up those two formulas back in chapter three to officially decide, yes, these events are independent or no, these events are not independent. And we can use those here in chapter four, but typically we'll do a gut check We'll say yes, they're independent, or no, they're not, or, or we'll just take, or we'll just take a leap of faith and say yes, they're independent. Um, so we'll we'll talk a little bit about this one as we start moving through examples. All right, the probability that a trial results in a success is the same for each trial. The probability of success is called p. All right, so it gets its own special letter, just like n did. These are the two important letters in the binomial experiment, and then the probability of failure is its complement. So again, if you have a 30% chance of success, you have a 70% chance of failure. Or if you have a 25% chance of success, you have a 75% chance of failure, right? The complement rule from back in chapter three. All right, so in the binomial distribution, if we're doing a binomial experiment, our variable, excuse me, our variable will quite literally be the number of successes observed in this experiment while the experiment is performed. Okay, and the notation that we're gonna give it is gonna be a special, a special notation. It'll be our first, and I call this squiggles. And squiggles is not a technical term, but the probability distribution of X is called the binomial probability distribution. We use this notation, X squiggles B N P. So this is saying X has the distribution of a binomial experiment. There are N trials, and the probability of success for any one trial is P, all right? And you can write this in lieu of a table. So 
So for all of those problems we had done before, the, we hit the binomials. All of those times where we had to make a table, this symbol, right? This symbol, X squiggles B and P, that is your PDF. So instead of doing all of the shenanigans, you don't have to, you can just write me this symbol. That is as good as a table. That's why I write here, you can make a table if you want. You're more than welcome to. It's just gonna take you a while. Or you can just write this symbol, all right? And the two important parameters that we give it are our fixed number of observations n and the probability of success for any one trial. Not over the totality of the experiment, but just one trial at a time. All right, so the first thing we need to get familiar with is just recognizing whether or not we're in a binomial experiment. So I'm gonna move this up a bit, all right? And then I'm gonna try and get this first experiment, this first setup into view, and we can still see the properties that we have to go through. All right, so determine whether the following experiments constitute a binomial experiment. If so, identify N, the number of trials in the experiment, and P, the probability of success. So let's try and do this for this first setup. A couple is planning on having five kids. They will keep track of the number of girls they have. All right, so you see number of, right? We got some kind of discrete numerical variable, but let's go through this. In this setup, do we have a fixed number of trials? Yes, we do, right? They said this couple is gonna have five kids. All right, each result, excuse me, each trial can result in one of two mutually exclusive outcomes, success and failure. Well, they told us here that they were gonna keep track of the number of girls. So we can call a success having a girl. And again, this is an example of why I put the success word in quotes. I don't want us to think that we're successful if we have girls and not successful if we don't have girls, but that's what we're keeping track of here. So that's what we'll call a success. All right, outcomes of different trials are independent. Yes, all right, having a boy or a girl the first time has no effect on whether you're gonna have a boy or girl the second time. And we can get like into discussions about the biology of it, but just th they're independent, all right? Let's just assume they're independent. Uh, we have a very large, uh, well, we won't necessarily have a large sample size, but I don't want to get into the biology of it, but there's plenty of times that you can have a boy or you can have a girl, and it has no effect on what your next child's gender would be, okay? All right, the probability that a trial results in a success is the same for each trial, and we're going to call that probability of success P. So we have that. We're going to say it's 50-50, and again, we could argue the biology of it, but let's just keep it simple for this first setup. All right, so in terms of is it binomial, let me show you how we start writing these up. So I need to check through it. As soon as I see I've got a discrete number of outcomes, right, or a discrete numerical variable, I might have to make a table, but let me check if it's binomial. So here we go. I have a fixed number of trials, so I am through the first property. I'm gonna put a little check mark there. All right, that second property said define success. And in this case, they're keeping track of girls, so having a girl. All right, and everything else will be um, categorized as a failure, right? Not having a girl. Okay, are trials independent? Yes, they are. And again, we can argue the biology of it, but for just simplicity's sake, in, in example 13a, trials are independent. The gender of your first kid has no bearing on the second. Gender your second kid has no bearing on the third, so on and so forth. So these trials are independent. And I'm not gonna use the formulas from chapter three to prove this. Again, this is just a gut check. All right, is the probability of success the same for each trial? Yes, each time out we have a 50-50 shot of having a girl. So since I can check through all four of those properties, I am in a binomial experiment. So what that means, is instead of making a table, and it would be a seven columned table, right? I need my label and then zero, one, two, three, four, or five. Instead of making that table, I can just write this symbol that X is binomially distributed. I have five kids, or I'm going to have five kids, and the probability of success for any one trial is 0.5. All right, so here's my variable number of girls I'm gonna have. It's binomially distributed. 
five trials, each trial has a 50% chance of success. And then by complement, it also has a 50% chance of failure. So this is a binomial experiment, okay? All right, so let's look at the setup in part B. It says a couple plans to continue to have kids until they have a girl. All right, so is this binomial? Well, the first thing I need to check is do I have a fixed number of observations, right? Do I have an N? And you can see this, the different wording between A and B. Here we had a fixed number of trials, right? The kids, or the kids, the couple was gonna have five kids, done. This is different, right? They're just gonna keep on having kids until they have a girl, right? So here, I don't have a fixed number of trials, right? That fails, and as soon as one of these four properties fail, you're done. This is not binomial. All right, this is actually geometric. Uh, it's one of those other types of discrete probability functions that your book covers that we don't explicitly cover in here. Um, and just for fun, I had a coworker at my old job who I swear it felt like he was doing this. He kept having kids until he finally had a boy. And it wasn't until his eighth kid that he finally had a boy. So you can see it, go, it could go well beyond five if you're playing that game. All right, so with that, let's take a look at this next setup, these next two, all right? So we've got, you will draw 10 cards from a deck of cards without replacement and count the number of kings. So we see number of kings, all right? I've got some kind of discrete numerical variable. It's possible I have to make a table, but let me check. If it's, if it's binomial. So let's see. We would have to look at the fixed number of trials, and I do have them. I'm gonna draw 10 cards. All right, n is 10, great. Can I declare something a success? And they're counting kings, so I'm gonna say that drawing a king is a success here. So I'll put my check mark there. Looking pretty good, I'm through half of them. Okay, so let's try the independent trials. Now the key phrase in here is without replacement. Okay. So then are trials independent of one another? If you imagine having a deck of cards and I pull a deck, I'm sorry, I pull one card out, all right, and I look at it and I, I figure out, yes, it's a king or no, it's not a king, and I toss it from the deck, I don't replace it. Does that affect what I might choose the next time? And the answer is yes, it absolutely affects what you can draw next. Because imagine if you drew a king out, right? That would affect how many kings were left in there and how many not kings were left in there, right? So when you sample without replacement, you fail to be independent, all right? At least when you have such a small deck of cards or a small number of cards, 52 is such a small number. Maybe if you had a million cards, it really wouldn't make a difference, but you don't have a million. You just have a single deck of cards. So the independent trials fails here. So again, this one is not binomial. All right, let's look at the setup in this last one. So let's try part D. This is, we're gonna still draw our 10 cards from a deck, but this time we're going with replacement and we're still gonna count the number of kings, right? So I still have that discrete numerical variable. So as we're going through this, n is 10, just like last time. Success, I'm still gonna draw a king. But now the trials are independent, all right? If I'm going through and I draw a card and I look at it and I put it back in, Right, then the probability of picking a king the next time out is the same as it was before, because I'm always gonna have four kings in the deck and 48 no kings in the deck, right? It's always gonna break down that way. So trials are independent. What's the probability of drawing a king? Well, as we said, there are four in there out of the 52. Right, you can reduce that fraction if you want, but I'm just gonna write it as a decimal. All right, so if I go four out of 52, I'm looking at about, I'd say 0 0.077. I'm going to round to three decimals. All right. So since I can put the check mark, oh, I didn't put one here. JK, there we go. Since I can put the check mark on all four properties, I get to say that my variable is distributed binomially, right? Distributed binomially. 
I have 10 cards that I'm going to select and the probability that on any one trial I select a king happens about 0.077 or I should say 7.7% of the time. All right. And then what happens if you were ever dealing with a problem like A or D, if you were on a binomial distribution, we're going to pick up shortcuts so that we don't have to make that table, we don't have to draw tree diagrams, uh, we don't have to do any of that stuff. We're going to get some calculator functions for that. So in the next example, we're going to practice this a little. We're going to look at our first binomial experiment. 